A couple weeks ago, I got into it on Facebook, Facebook argument with a friend, which, as with most arguments on Facebook, rapidly spiraled down into oblivion. So cautionary tale, don't get involved in fights on Facebook. No, nobody, nobody comes off well. And the subject of the fight isn't really what is relevant here, but for the sake of the Schumachers and like the Turners and maybe Alyssa, I'll throw out that we were arguing about the old TV show Firefly. Okay, so this, I mean, this came out my senior year at Kenyon, uh, so it's been a while. And it is, this again, is not super relevant, but just for some context, it is a space western, uh, sci-fi western that is like kind of modeled on the post-Civil War America. And the heroes, the, the plucky protagonists, are basically based on the Confederacy. And you're like, this is questionable, right? Like, can you really separate the vibes and the aesthetics of the Confederacy from the reality of racism and slavery? And it's sort of, I use the word, problematic. And like, we just, we were going back and forth. And he was like, I just don't see why you hate this show so much. I think we shouldn't watch it anymore. And I was like, I don't. I've never said that. I never said that. Um, this is not a cancel Firefly conversation. He was like, well, you said it was problematic. And when people say something's problematic, they want to get rid of it altogether. And like, my friend was right. You know, I don't blame him at all because it's very true that we do live in a context a culture where as soon as something is thought to be transgressing at all, thought to be, dare I say, problematic in any way, rather than being able to have thoughtful, nuanced critique of said thing, it automatically becomes said thing is just bad and should not be. I'm sure we have all experienced this phenomenon to some degree. And it's one thing when you are talking about an 18-year-old cult classic TV show that had all of 13 episodes, and it is another thing when we're talking about people who are certainly complex and nuanced. And we do not especially live in a world or a moment that creates space for the inevitable reality of sin that exists within ourselves, how we make room for that, move on from that, and certainly how we make room for that in others. Which really, I think, is what is at the heart of today's parable. Which, on the surface, is very straightforward compared to some of the texts that we have been reading in Luke the last couple weeks. Luke has been throwing us some curveballs, and today, thankfully, it seems like we have a nice, straightforward morality tale, for lack of a better word. We have the righteous Pharisee who goes up to the temple and is like, I'm so glad I'm righteous. Here's all the things that I'm doing. Thank you, God, for making me so righteous and not like this other guy. Meanwhile, the other guy, the tax collector, is sitting before God in the reality of his sin, his wrong. And we are told this is the one who goes away justified. And I think there are a couple of assumptions we can make about this text on a very straightforward reading that we have to be careful of, right? And the first is that character of the Pharisee. And this is, I'll get on one of my little soapboxes, as it were, but we do always have to be careful in terms of how we read and think about the Pharisees in the New Testament through our Christian lens that has been conditioned to read the New Testament through a lens that can veer very rapidly into anti-Semitic assumptions. And the Pharisee here is not actually a villain or the bad guy. 
He is, to the audience who is no doubt standing around Jesus and in the context of his time, he is righteous. He is doing the right things. He is faithful. And if there is a villain here, it is the tax collector, right? Because the, tax, the, the sin that the tax collector is bewailing is real and actual sin. It is wrong. The, and this is a good, like, nice preface for getting into the story of Zacchaeus next week, so stay tuned. But the tax collectors exploited wealth. They, they took advantage of the people. They hoarded wealth. And I think very importantly from the context of this story, the tax collectors were the collaborators with the Roman Empire against their own people. They were traitors for lack of a better word, not to put it too lightly. So the tax collector is actually a bad guy. And the Pharisee is not wrong <laughs> for saying so. But I think we have to remember that is the point Jesus is trying to make and get at. How we understand human faithfulness and righteousness in comparison to God's righteousness. And there is a very interesting dichotomy that's a pretty stark binary being drawn out in these two characters, the righteous Pharisee and the tax collector lamenting his sin. But I think the, the reality and the call of this parable exists in some messy nuance of the middle between these two stark contrasts. And I think that's where we get into a much more nuanced reading of this text, because it's a very tricky one, right? We can read this parable, and the minute we go, oh, we're so glad we're not like the Pharisee, we have, in fact, become the Pharisee. Uh, and I think that can take on many insidious forms in the world that we live in today. I dare say to, to jump on some of the buzzwords that have been in some ways used and overused to the point that they lack all meaning. We all know the ideas of cancel culture, of call-out culture, of a notion of righteousness that we can assume for ourselves and our communities that is very much takes the form of, I am so glad I am not that person, right? I think in a church like the Episcopal Church, where we pride ourselves on our inclusiveness, our advocacy for social justice, we can very fastly and rapidly jump into Oh, we're so glad we're not like those other Christians. We're the good ones, right? And I think about it when, you know, you have those videos online that have gone viral. And certainly some of you have witnessed this phenomenon where they catch the person online doing something that is, in fact, wrong and racist, uh, you, you know videos of the white woman who was found calling the police on a black man often, and the person is, their, their name, their workplace is found, they are harassed online until they are, you know, they lose their job. And, and everyone on the, you know, internet gets to feel very righteous and vindicated for having stood up for the cause of social justice. And this is not to condone the people who get caught in those videos at all. But often the discourse around it is, well, this person is just a terrible racist. I'm not, obviously. And if we can prove that this person is a terrible racist and unforgivable and, and clearly just a garbage human being, I can be sure that I'm not. And that I'm one of the good ones. And it's not a healthy or good dynamic. It does nothing to actually advance the cause of racial justice or equity or reconciliation. 
It just serves a sense of righteousness for a lot of online keyboard warriors, if we're honest. And I think the reality of this parable, or the truth of this parable that we are called to sit with, is not the non-existence of sin, right? The tax collector is the bad guy. The tax collector is sinful. The tax collector should be repenting and humble before God. The people who get called out in those videos online are wrong and participating in racism. There is sin and evil of which we must repent. But it is sin and evil, brokenness, in which we all exist, in which we all participate in some form. We are all, from time to time, I dare say, problematic to use that word from my fight with my friend online. And what does it mean to live in the complexity of that reality? To have the courage and honesty not to, you know, satisfy or encourage or build up ourselves by looking at how we perceive ourselves to be better than others more righteous, more committed to justice, the best allies, unlike people we might call out online. But what does it mean to sit honestly with ourselves and our own fallenness and brokenness? And I think if to bring this back to the gospel, the good news, the reality is that the more fully we live into the goal, the ultimate aim of our Christian life, which is in fact communion with God, communion with God's perfect, reconciling, redeeming love, the more fully we enter into that reality, we aren't inflated with a sense of our own righteousness. We, we become aware of how far we are, in fact, from God's perfection and are drawn to live more fully into that reality every day. That is the heart of our baptismal covenant within the Episcopal Church, where one of the promises that we make when we are baptized and every time we renew our baptismal vows as a community is that we will continue in following Christ's teachings and whenever we sin, we will repent and return to the Lord. And that is a, a helpful truth for us to hold in our hearts as we begin approaching the end of the liturgical calendar and anticipate the season of Advent, which is a season of repenting and making ourselves ready to receive once again the fullness of God's presence in our lives. And I'll just close with this little reminder and a little note of a discipline that maybe we can take into our lives. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Jesus Prayer. Anyone familiar with the Jesus Prayer? Thanks, Robert. Yeah, Ben. But uh, so the Jesus Prayer comes from the Eastern Orthodox Church, and the idea is that it is a tool that you use in order to pray without ceasing as we are called. If you're someone who struggles to create a solid, regular discipline of prayer, just keeping the Jesus prayer in the back of your mind can be very powerful. And the prayer is, Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, have mercy on me, a sinner. 
And the purpose of that is not to just dwell in our sinfulness. We are not Calvinists here. We do not have to, you know, be constantly aware of the total depravity of the human condition. But to focus on Christ, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, have mercy on me, a sinner. That the more we enter into that consciousness of God's presence in our lives, the more fully we desire to live into it more and more. That is the ground of our Christian lives. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on all of us sinners as we are, and may we share that mercy with those around us.